The Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship, is made possible in part by our signature partner, Amgen. Committed to transforming new ideas and discoveries into medicines for patients with serious illness. The following episode is brought to you by Exact Sciences. Exact Sciences, changing the way we think about detecting and treating cancer. For more information, visit exactsciences.com. As the cancer survivor movement grows, there's also an increasing focus on who doesn't survive. Who doesn't get screened in time so their cancer is caught early? Who doesn't get the benefits of the newest life-saving treatments developed in clinical trials? Who doesn't have access to drugs that can greatly improve a cancer survivor's quality of life, even if they can't cure the disease itself? Cancer disparities is one way of saying that cancer sucks for everyone, but it sucks a whole lot more for some people. These disparities are strongly linked to factors like income, education, racism, geography, housing, and access to healthcare and nutritious foods. All of this falls under the umbrella of what's called social determinants of health. In this episode, we're going to look at the disparities affecting some specific groups, what's causing them, and what cancer mavericks from these communities have done to advocate for themselves and others like them. The story starts in April of 1987 with a woman named Mary P. Lovato. I'm Mary Lovato, Santo Domingo tribe, and I'm from Santo Domingo Pueblo, New Mexico. Santo Domingo Pueblo, now known as Kewa Pueblo, is a federally recognized tribe of Native American Pueblo people in northern New Mexico. Cancer incidents and mortality rates for indigenous people vary widely by region. But in general, data shows over the past few decades, American Indian and Alaska Native people are not experiencing the same improvements in cancer care and survival rates that white people are. Advocates like Mary Lovato took these statistics head on by fighting for and running Native-led healthcare services. You're hearing an interview with Mary recorded in the 90s. I've always remembered the day I was ill. It was on an Easter Sunday, and before Easter Sunday, I worked graveyard shift at UNM Hospital. My kids were picked up at the apartment, and they were participating in the Native dance at home. And during Easter Sunday, I started getting high fever all day long, and I was taking Tylenol after Tylenol, and it was breaking my high fever. She waited another hour before deciding to go to the hospital. I was admitted with a high fever of 104.8, and I was in for the whole week. And during that time, they took all sorts of tests, but they didn't tell me yet what or whatever my diagnosis would be. A week later, the hospital called and told her she needed to make an appointment with an oncologist. She had a spinal tap, and the doctor asked her about her family health history. He told me that I was diagnosed with acute leukemia. And I was so scared. I didn't know what else to do. I have three kids. I had just gotten out of a relationship that was like 12 and a half years relationship. And for a while, I blamed myself for it. Maybe God's punishing me coming down with this illness. The doctor wanted Mary to tell her family what was going on. But I refused. I didn't want my family to know about my illness just then. I started going to the bars in the evenings at night when I couldn't sleep. I started drinking a lot, thinking that my illness would go away. Or then I would say, you know, if I'm going to die, I'll die. You know, I'll just die like this. And so I didn't let my family know for about a whole week. But her doctor didn't give up. He kept calling me at my apartment, telling me to come back down, that he needed to talk to me more. She went back to the doctor's office, and she finally decided to open up about her cancer. She called her family and arranged for them to come to the hospital. They didn't know what leukemia was. They didn't know what cancer was. 
So everybody uh, that came down, they told them that I was ill. And my brothers and sisters just started crying. They didn't know how to act. They didn't know what to say. Her family wanted to support her however they could. They got blood tests to see if anyone was a match for her and could donate their bone marrow for a transplant. And I had three brothers, six sisters, so I had a big family. So luckily, my older sister matched up with me, and she went out with me to UCLA in California. Mary was a member of a federally recognized tribe, lived near a major city, and therefore had access to health care, but she still had to travel far for cancer treatment. She was in Los Angeles, over 800 miles from home, for three months after receiving a bone marrow transplant from her sister. She was devastated to be all alone at UCLA for her treatment. This is Dr. Linda Burhan Stepanoff, a.k.a. Linda B. She is the founder and president of the American Indian Cancer Research Corporation. It's an organization fighting to lower the incidence of cancer and increase cancer survival among indigenous people. Linda and Mary were friends. Linda says, in Indian country, most health care comes from the Indian Health Service, or IHS. It's a federal agency responsible for providing health care to American Indians and Alaska Natives. At the time Mary was diagnosed with leukemia, there were no IHS oncology centers anywhere near her home in New Mexico. So you had to be referred out. So Mary was stuck in California. During her treatment, she reflected on what she would do with the rest of her life. After I had my bone marrow transplant, I had a vision of my parents. I never knew my mom, but I knew my dad. I was only 12 my dad passed away. My mother passed away when I was only two. They came to me and told me that I had some sort of a responsibility to do within the Pueblo, but they didn't give me an idea what. When she returned to her Pueblo in New Mexico, Mary's doctors told her that for the good of her own health, she had to isolate for a while. My family was supportive of that. They didn't let anybody know that I had came home. Mary's medical isolation turned into social isolation, even after her doctors cleared her. People in her community were scared her illness was contagious. Linda says they did not want to talk about it. She was very frustrated with how people would not acknowledge cancer existed in the community. But they just wanted to have blinders on because if we said the word cancer, it spread the cancer disease. Then one night, the vision just came to me where I had all sorts of people sitting around in this one huge building. And we were all talking about different illnesses and crying on each other's shoulders. And then at 5 o'clock in the morning, I woke up my sister and told her, get the family together. I was so excited and all anxious to talk to them. Once I told them what I wanted to do, I wanted to start a support group. They didn't know what support group was. And I just told them, well, I had a vision of having whole, all sorts of people sitting together and talking about our illnesses. Step by step, Mary made her dream of a support group in the Pueblo a reality. At first, no one showed up, but she didn't give up. Over time, she built trust within the community. For three years, Mary and other volunteers ran support groups for cancer survivors without any pay or financial assistance, knowing their services could save lives. We were able to get in contact with Living Through Cancer, and they were the ones that helped us write a proposal and get a grant from IHS. Any financial support from the Indian Health Service, or IHS, was a huge deal. Linda B. told us the agency is seriously underfunded by Congress. We get less money per patient uh, than we have in prisons. Um, we're the lowest funded institute in the United States, always have been. IHS spends about $3,000 per patient a year on average. Compare that to Medicare, about $13,000. Medicaid, about $8,000. And the Department of Corrections, $6,000. 
Under treaty agreements signed with the tribes, the U.S. government is legally required to provide health care to American Indians and Alaska Natives. But it's been an ongoing struggle to have this obligation honored. Good evening. American Indian leaders today accused the Reagan administration of trying to subvert laws and court decisions in its new budget proposal. According to a 2018 report from the Independent and Bipartisan Commission on Civil Rights, the U.S. government has not adequately funded federal programs for Native Americans. Nearly every treaty talks about health care, and yet uh, the Indian Health Service is completely underfunded. But Mary believed in what she was doing, and she kept at it. She had so much perseverance and diligence. In 1993, Mary joined the staff at People Living Through Cancer, the pioneering organization in Albuquerque that we talked about in episode two and that helped shape the survivorship movement. I do one-to-one consultation with cancer patients that had been diagnosed. Then I also do a family circle. We have family meetings in the evenings and I interpret for the patients that have been diagnosed with cancer. And I also go with them to the hospitals so that I would know what kind of a treatment that they're gonna be receiving so I could translate back to the family. Mary directed a program called A Gathering for Cancer Support. And her support circles and training programs expanded from serving nine Pueblos in New Mexico to reach tribes across the country. I do a lot of early detection programs here in the Pueblo educational programs. Also, I'm working a lot with men doing their prostate, and I have models that I use in order for me to get through the men. Sometimes they can be so stubborn. When I was first invited to speak with the council members, I hurried all over. I bragged about it. I came home and told everybody I was invited for a council member meeting. And once I got there, I told them what I was going to do, and I explained to them what prostate cancer was. And a lot of them didn't want to say anything about it because they said, whoa, what's a woman to tell us about our body parts? But I always have to put a little humor in. So I told them, once you see one, you've seen them all, you know? (laughs) And then one man in the back says, Well, if I was to get up in front of you, would you be able to test my prostate, see if I have cancer? I said, of course, if you want to be a model for the whole people here, you want them to look at you, sure, I'll be glad to. So they started laughing, and yeah, she'll do it, she'll do it, so we better not talk no more. When Mary started her advocacy work, cancer was low on the list of prioritized health conditions that IHS would cover. Chemo and radiation for just one person could wipe out a tribe's entire IHS budget. We've been trying to get cancer as a higher visibility issue throughout Indian country. You might think that higher visibility is automatically a good thing. But in Linda's experience, increased attention to cancer can mean non-Native service providers run in to try to fix the problem without building trust first. Vast deposits of uranium have been discovered in the Navajo Hills. Kewa Pueblo is near the Navajo Nation, which spans parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. According to the EPA, there are more than 500 abandoned uranium mines on this indigenous territory. The sound you hear is not static, but an instrument called a Geiger counter. The popping and crackling tell us there is a radioactive substance nearby, in this case, a piece of uranium ore. The rate of bone cancer in children who live near mining areas is 500% higher than usual, and the incidence of leukemia is 250% higher. Federal statistics show a direct connection between uranium mining and lung cancer. In New Mexico, called the uranium capital of the world, Studies show that people who simply live near uranium mines have four times the chance of getting cancer as the average American. Researchers call areas with high cancer rates cancer clusters. It's important to study these clusters, and that includes understanding the subtle and overt racism that led to these disparities. But Linda says if researchers are not familiar with local traditions or aware of their sense of superiority, 
the process can be more harmful than helpful. Environmental Protection Agency had reports, literally stats like this. Linda worked as a consultant for a tribal chairman who was frustrated with the EPA's investigation of cancer in his community. People from the agency would dump a bunch of graphs and complex information and then leave. And they're stacked all over the tribal chairman's desk. And he says, I don't know what these mean. I don't know how to interpret these. You know, we want them to just tell us what we need to do to protect our people on it. And he got so angry and the Environmental Protection Agency people were saying, he was so rude, we're not going back. We gave him all the raw data, he can figure it out himself. Leaving stacks of paper full of words someone doesn't understand is clearly not a successful strategy for sharing information. Medical terminology is not intuitive, especially for people whose first language is not English. That's why Mary trained Native people, navigators, to accompany cancer survivors to their appointments to help them in potentially confusing moments. We often think of communication as simply a good thing, but words can also be dangerous. A completely well-intended sentence can be easily misinterpreted. Telling a patient you're positive for cancer, positive usually means good. So now the patient thinks, oh, I don't have cancer. It was positive. I got a good test. And then the doctor says, no, 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 you have to go into treatment. Now she doesn't trust that doctor because that doctor tried to make her a fool telling her it was positive when it wasn't when she had cancer. So now there's more distrust, and we have enough distrust anyway, between our community and the healthcare facility. Navigators from the community are crucial because if patients feel their doctor doesn't respect their culture, they may not ask how to integrate treatment into their life. When service providers show respect, it can alleviate some of the mental and emotional pain that goes along with the physical struggles of cancer. Patients might blame themselves for getting sick, like Mary did at first. Guilt and shame can be unwelcome guests lingering in the hospital room after getting diagnosed with a stigmatized disease. Mary taught Native people to understand that cancer is not a punishment. It's not a curse. It's not contagious. And there are strategies to advocate for yourself and survive. Mary P. Lovato's vision for self-determination and Native-led support circles led to a national program called Survivorship in Indian Country. It was the first nonprofit cancer support and education program specifically for Indigenous people in the United States. Linda shares one reason this is important. When Indians go to non-Native support groups, they spend a lot of time talking about being Indian rather than dealing with the cancer, which is why it's nice to have an American Indian support group or an Alaska Native support group rather than a generic multiracial support group. Mary Lovato survived leukemia, bone cancer, and kidney cancer for 23 years. We were so lucky to have her. <laughs> in 1997, the Pueblo of Santo Domingo, now called Kewa Pueblo, officially allocated land on the reservation to be designated as the site for the Mary P. Lovato National Cancer Survivors Training Facility. However, more than 20 years later, the funding to build Mary's training center still hasn't arrived. Mary P. Lovato passed away in 2008, but her legacy carries on through the hundreds of people she trained, the stories she shared, and the support networks she helped create. She believed Native people could break the silence around cancer and fill it with an outpouring of mutual support. She's remembered for her visionary efforts to improve the treatment options offered to Native people. After the break, we're going to dive into clinical trials, namely 
their history of serving a mostly white population and what advocates are doing to change that. How do you afford to get to the trial? Where do you stay when you're in the trial? Who pays for that? Stay with us. Additional support for the Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship, is made possible by the following partners. Bristol Myers Squibb, Daiichi Senkyo, Merck, Seagen, Takeda, Pharmacyclics, an AbbVie company, and Janssen. Learn more about these supporters at cancermavericks.com. My friend and fellow young adult cancer survivor, Mae McCarmo, knew something wasn't right with her body, but she had to fight to get diagnosed and treated. Now she runs a nonprofit called the Tiger Lily Foundation, which aims to educate, advocate, and empower young women before, during, and after breast cancer. One of MAMA's goals is getting more black women involved in conversations about cancer and enrolled in clinical trials. Producer Susie Armitage has her story. Mema Carmo grew up in Liberia, where her mother was head of the country's nursing association. Part of her job was to train laywomen from different villages. They would take buses or walk for miles and come into the city where she would teach them how to become nurses. It was very formative to watch what she was doing. Women who were coming in who, what we now know as having geographical barriers or literacy barriers or ethnic and tribal barriers and lack of access, you know, finances and transportation. They were making their way to this city to get access to life-saving um, education and resources. And when Mayma hit puberty, her mother taught her how to do breast self-exams. Um, the moment she saw I had breasts, she sat me down one rainy afternoon and told me that, I, I see you have breasts now. I know that you're embarrassed about them, but you need to know that your breasts are important and they're going to change over time. And knowing about your body can save your life and it can empower you to know, to know how to treat yourself and how to get help if something goes wrong. Mayma says her mother's lesson did ultimately save her life. By then, her family had fled Liberia's civil war and settled in America. Mayma was 31 with a young daughter of her own and living in the Washington, D.C. area. And one day in the shower, um, I was singing Diana Ross, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, and just dancing in the shower, um, getting ready for work. And I just was doing my exam, and there was a lump in my breast. And my whole world stopped. She had no family history of breast cancer, and her age was considered a low risk. Mema asked for a mammogram, which found two lumps. Then her doctor referred her to a breast surgeon. Who said, you have no evidence of breast cancer. You're fine. Go back and live. Go live your life. Just come back when you're older. Come back in six months or a year. Don't worry about it. But Mema couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. And I said, well, if it's not a tumor, can we try to aspirate it? Aspiration is a procedure that can help determine if a lump is a harmless cyst or a cancerous tumor. Imagine having a balloon filled with water. When you poke it with a needle, it'll aspirate the fluid, right? It'll come out but it wasn't aspirating. Mema pushed for a biopsy, even though the breast surgeon thought it wasn't necessary. And she was kind of mocking me, like saying, you know, this is a waste of time. And um, I did it. And I kept telling myself, you're going to be fine. It wasn't fine. When a doctor calls your phone multiple times, it's never a good thing. Her diagnosis? Stage two breast cancer. Mema realized how important it was that she had pushed for the biopsy, that she'd felt empowered to advocate for herself and push back on the surgeon's initial recommendations. What's the word? I felt small. The way she spoke to me, I felt small. I felt unimportant. I felt stupid. I felt talked down to. If I hadn't had a mother who was a nurse, if I hadn't seen my mom talk to doctors eyeball to eyeball my whole life, I would be dead today. There's no way to know for sure what Mema's prognosis would have been. But when it comes to cancer, delays can be a matter of life and death. So when they finally got me diagnosed, the tumor had doubled in size. Mema began treatment. And like so many of the cancer mavericks we've covered on this show, she made a promise that if she survived, she would do whatever she could to help others with the disease. 
She founded the Tiger Lily Foundation to support and empower young women with breast cancer. Soon, she was working closely with Congresswoman and fellow survivor Debbie Wasserman Schultz on a bill called the Early Act. We are here today to announce the introduction of the Early Act, the Breast Cancer Education and Awareness Requires Learning Young Act of 2009. It funds awareness campaigns, screening, and research on breast cancer in women under 40. I didn't find my tumor early because of luck. I found my tumor early because of knowledge and awareness. I knew that I should perform breast self-exams, and I was aware of what my body was supposed to feel like. It is my hope that by sharing my story, we will pass the Breast Cancer Education and Awareness Requires Learning Young Act of 2009 into law this year. I'm sorry. It became law in 2009. Mayma isn't just passionate about making sure young women get the screening and treatment they need. She's also committed to reducing the disparities in who survives breast cancer. As I looked into the numbers, I found that women of color had a 40% higher death rate than their white counterparts. Um, we weren't offered genetic testing. Um, we weren't offered clinical trials. Uh, the enrollment for trials was at a 3% rate for Black women. This is a big issue across different types of cancer. Clinical trials are important because they can unlock promising new treatments. But historically, the majority of patients in trials have been white. Dr. Carmen Guerra is the Associate Director of Diversity and Outreach at the University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center. There is research that's uh, public from the FDA uh, that looks at the proportion of uh, Black patients that participated in oncology trials, uh, and it's only 4%. Um, so there's a, a dramatic and striking underrepresentation of Black patients in cancer clinical trials. That can increase disparities. In oncology, we use the standard of care. And, and so if you have a certain type of cancer, you show up at the doctor, we know what that standard of care is, and you will be offered that. But if you go to a center where they do research, like an NCI comprehensive cancer center, and there's only 60 plus of those in the entire country, um, you will probably have the m most options of research to participate in. And, and the reason it's important is because you might say, okay, well, that's the standard of care, but perhaps, you know, there's a better treatment out there than the standard of care. And they're studying that. And I would be among the first people to receive that. The lack of diversity in clinical trials means fewer patients of color are able to benefit from new and more effective treatments. But it also means the research is incomplete. Clinical trial will show whether a treatment is better or not than the standard of care. However, if we just studied white individuals, you know, how do we know that those results are going to hold true for Black individuals, Latinx individuals? What is a young person with that cancer versus an older patient with that cancer? How do they respond to the treatment? There are many reasons trials skew towards wealthier, whiter, and older patient populations. One of them is money. The experimental treatment provided in a trial is free, but insurance is still expected to pay for the routine patient care. Plus, there are other practical costs. Here's Mema again. How do you afford to get to the trial? How, where do you stay when you're in the trial? Who pays for that? Who pays for your gas? Who pays for your lost wages? And if you're leaving for a trial and coming back home and tired and you're sick, um, you're missing work, who pays for those lost wages or a lost job? Trials often work on a reimbursement basis. Participants need to pay for all the costs up front, which can be impossible for someone on a tight budget. Then there's the paperwork. Lots and lots of paperwork. Even the, the, the consent forms. Um, the, the consent forms are hard to understand. They're exclusive. Um, they're scary. They're very clinical. Clinical trial administrators may also exclude people due to biased assumptions, whether or not they realize it. They can just say subjectively, you know, this person wouldn't adhere. They live too far. They, they have some kind of psychological issue. They have a couple of kids. Some doctors may not even suggest a clinical trial for the same reasons. Dr. Guerra has spent years studying health disparities and the many barriers that prevent patients from getting timely screening and treatment. It was like peeling the onion. You know, I would think I knew, understood a barrier and then I would peel back and learn that there were others hiding under that onion. 
you know, everything from health literacy to the transportation barriers to uh, insurance barriers, lack of access to insurance, um, transportation and language were common. Lack of trust can also be a barrier for people from marginalized groups that have historically been mistreated by the medical system. Dr. Guerra says health providers and institutions need to work on building that missing trust. I would furthermore challenge people not to label that community as distrustful because that's almost a little bit like blaming the victim, right? Like you don't want to blame people for the problem that their community is experiencing, but rather challenge people to say, what is it about the organization that made it less trustworthy? Dr. Guerra and her colleagues at the Abramson Cancer Center wanted to increase the number of Black patients in their clinical trials. The center's West Philadelphia neighborhood is 72% Black, but in 2014, just 11% of patients at the cancer center were Black. So they did a bunch of different things. They partnered with leaders from the community, including Black churches and mosques, to promote cancer awareness and screening. But well, most of all, we were there to also listen to what their needs were. And what we heard was, you know, we are seeing our brothers and sisters die of cancer at just, you know, really high rates. We need help to stop this unequal burden of cancer in our communities. They changed the messaging on their website, brochures, and social media to reflect the stories of Black patients. They worked with navigators to help patients who didn't have insurance get covered and educate them about the option of clinical trials. And they started a transportation program to help patients get to and from the cancer center. A lot of problems that are complex, you know, like the onion model, you're not going to make a dent unless your solutions also equally address the many components of the barriers. In 2014, 12% of patients in Abramson's clinical trials were Black. By 2018, that number had almost doubled to nearly 24%. For researchers hoping to increase the diversity of patients in their trials, Dr. Guerra says there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Leave the office, go out into this communities, listen to the way they perceive the problem, and work with them to develop ways to overcome the barriers to accessing clinical trials. Mayma Carmo of the Tiger Lily Foundation says listening to survivor populations that are often overlooked and ignored, like Black women, young women, and women with metastatic breast cancer, is crucial across all cancer care and advocacy. I would go to conferences all the time, and I would never see Black patients at the table on the platform speaking. How do you fix a problem if the people you want to fix the problem with or for are never in the room? So Mema has worked to get Black women from communities with the highest death rates in the room, training them to be advocates and bringing them to major events like the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. That's why Mema and other advocates have asked companies, organizations, and individuals working in the cancer world to sign an inclusion pledge. It reads, We commit to taking specific actions to dismantle systemic barriers and end disparities. We pledge to only participate in initiatives, panels, boards, planning committees, programs that include the experience of Black women. The pledge has gotten more than 12,000 signatures so far and commitments from major pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer. We're advising them on how to build clinical trials the right way, how to design them, how to even ask the, the right research questions. Um, we're working with them now to deploy our patient advocates to help them through the entire clinical trial work stream. That can include everything from redesigning consent forms to make them less intimidating, to coming up with solutions for transportation. For those who live in rural communities that are further out, they don't have, some people don't have oncologists in their healthcare centers. They don't have a mammogram machine in their healthcare center. So if you have, a, again, an hourly wage job or a job paying you a low wage and you have to go to a hospital 50 miles away and there's no bus to get there or, or train or whatever, what, what are you going to do? Mema is passionate about ending health disparities, not at some distant point in the future, but as soon as possible. We're all part of the problem or part of the solution. And so I ask everybody I meet, how can you be part of the solution? 
And how can you use your privilege for power and um, use that to work to achieve health equity in our lifetime? That's what the Inclusion Pledge asks people to do. That was producer Susie Armitage. To learn more about the Tiger Lily Foundation's Inclusion Pledge, check out this episode's show notes or visit tigerlilyfoundation.org. The Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship, is a production of Offscript Health in partnership with Small Good Thing. The executive producer is Steve Lichtai. Our senior producers are Susie Armitage, Mary Rose Madden, and Andrew McDowell. Our associate producers are Mariah Dennis and Mar Laser. And our production assistant is Sophia Kurzius. Sound design and mixing is by David Schulman. And our music is composed and performed by me, Matthew Zachary. For more information about this series, visit CancerMavericks.com. That's CancerMavericks.com. Thank you.